All right. Well, <clears throat> thanks for coming. I'm sure you've got plenty of other things on your mind on this fairly significant day. I'd like to thank Duncan and John for their previous presentations. My presentation is not going to be anywhere near as statistically rigorous. It's more of a qualitative than a quantitative study, if you know what I mean. But it is interesting to me to have heard those presentations because I'm talking about a sector of workers who are both educated and professional in the terms that John was discussing, but at the same time casualised or in some cases on zero hours contract because I noticed in Duncan's presentation that number three on the list after hospitality and health were other sectors including the arts for zero hours contract. So it's kind of a synthesis of the, the concerns of those two papers. What happens to the professionals who don't end up in the top jobs because they happen to be qualified as arts workers? That's the preamble. Uh, forgive me for reading, but I will try to communicate effectively. Is this my little thing? There we go. Happy days. I don't use these very often, so bear with me if I make a few mistakes on that. So UK government policies for arts and culture proclaim the economic and social benefits of creative industries. The capacity of arts workers to work flexibly, collaboratively and independently is increasingly promoted as a model for workplace relations everywhere. Yet there's little understanding of the financial, social and personal implications of this model. So I'm looking at working conditions in the arts sector. I'm drawing on interviews with practitioners and also ethnographic studies with practitioners who've been established for more than five years, all of whom contributed to the Derry Stroke London Derry UK City of Culture in 2013, which is a significant turning point. Not all of whom are based in Derry Stroke London Derry, but all of whom contributed to it. And this is particularly looking at community arts workers as against pure uh, main stage theatre or, or visual artists, as in people who work in the community with their arts. And what's interesting in Northern Ireland is most people who work as artists what might be regarded in England as, you know, pure artists or higher art, right, also work in communities and most people who work in communities are also artists in their own right. As against some places like Australia where you're either an artist or a community cultural development worker. And there's been a separation. I'll talk about that later. But they work in community and voluntary groups. They work for health and well-being. They work with groups of older people, people with disabilities. They have done a lot of work in conflict transformation. In a lot of cases, the only time a Protestant and a Catholic child will meet each other will be through a community arts project until they get to university. Uh, so it enhances the lives of young people and older people. Uh, they support well-being, peace building, and social development in the region, and they're committed to that work. But the work is underpaid and insecure. They are dependent on public funding, which has been significantly reduced, and they are trying to find alternative sources of income for survival. Um, this is part of a broader project on the first page, sorry I flicked on too early, you saw Martin Byrne and Stephanie Knight in Glasgow, uh, Martin Byrne's Professor of Management and Organisational Behaviour in, in Scotland uh, at the University of Glasgow. So we're doing a study of freelance artists in community arts practice in Northern Ireland and Scotland over the last three years, uh, how they cope with current models of funding and evaluation. Um, and the aim is to develop a clearer understanding of the measures by which these artists sustain their practice and themselves and stand their own creative ground while continuing to support their families and their communities. So the, method, uh, the methodology is, um, it was going to be 20 if you've been closely reading the abstract, but two of them emigrated. Again, like John, this doesn't include the people who've moved to England for full-time jobs, not all of which are in the arts, but yes, there were two people I was going to interview, but they left and they didn't want to interview anymore. But 18 community drama, dance, music and visual arts practitioners I've been living in Derry for 16 years. I'm originally from Australia, you might notice from my accent. Uh, so I know these people well, and I was a freelance community artist before I did my PhD on the impact of community arts in Northern Ireland since the Good Friday Agreement. But we have been holding formal, structured interviews, questionnaires, group interviews, participant observation and practice, and holding seminars with um, the interviewees since 2012, as well as I've engaged in advocacy and consultation with those organisations uh, trying to negotiate um, better terms for those artists and the communities they work with. So, uh, the funding policy and political context has been crucial 
in both supporting and constraining the work of these artists and communities. Since 2010, there has been a shift towards economic regeneration and public health as a priority, but previously community relations and peace building were the key priorities. So local, national and international bodies funded arts projects addressing conflict and sectarianism in Northern Ireland with varying degrees of success since the beginning of the Troubles. Prior to 98, grassroots community-based artists were at the forefront of providing hope and sustaining local economies. There's references there. And since 98, the peace process provided a great deal of funding and new opportunities for arts organisations, communities and individuals to develop new collaborative work and support cross-community relationships. Uh, the peace process drew down an unprecedented level of funding, including 2.2 billion euro into the region from the European Union alone between 2000 and 2006. Significant amounts more were provided by the International Fund for Ireland and the UK government and the Irish government. Uh, significant amounts of that funding were spent on community arts projects, although it's impossible to estimate entirely because records were only kept according to strategic priorities rather than mode of delivery. But all of the arts projects I looked at drew down funding from several sources, and many of them from uh, EU peace programs. So, in 2013, uh, the Derry City of Culture, Derry Struggle under Derry, sorry, hosted, I live there, <laughs> hosted the inaugural UK City of Culture. The event was a significant turn in cultural strategy for Northern Ireland, away from centrally funded social development and peace building towards corporate rebranding, tourism promotion, and public relations approaches to arts policy. Uh, in the run up to the event, the city was rebranded as legendary. Uh, to generate a step change whereby the city could tell a new story. And the expectation in the city, bolstered by the original bid document, was that this would provide substantial funding for local artists and arts organisations. However, the UK City of Culture supplies no external funding, unlike European Capital of Culture, which does from European funding. So it ended up being that Derry, in some uh, indicators the poorest city in the UK having to pay for uh, the UK City of Culture event out of its own pocket, ending up significantly in debt, uh, and the only external investment was from other Northern Ireland based bodies in general. There was a little bit from the British Council. Um, this was a hopefully going to address the 41.5% of the population of the City of Derry being economically inactive at the time in 2012 quite a few people with that work. The City of Culture project was funded mainly from public bodies in Northern Ireland, but in the event, local businesses, community groups, political representatives were disappointed and frustrated with the inability of the City of Culture to increase employment rates. In the three years since, it's still uh, very high at 41.6% of the population. So although you can't blame that on the UK City of Culture not creating jobs, you can't claim that it did because still have the same levels of long-term unemployment. And that includes 33% of people between 16 and 64, so you can't just say it's the old, older population that have retired from being unemployed. Um, according to Boland, it was never really going to be able to make a big difference economically in the global economic downturn and, and with austerity policies. It's not going to be a panacea for deep-seated problem. And the Derry London Derry is official report, the City of Culture event says, um, without broader strategy of supporting investment, it was never going to make a big difference. But there was some indication of significant cultural change. People had a good time and felt better about living in the place. However, for the artists, quite a large amount of money was spent on bringing in flagship, flagship, flagship artists like Hoffe Schechter and Frank Cottrell Boyce. However, and these, these put on productions that involved large casts of unpaid community volunteers. But the people who'd been working with those communities throughout the previous 10 years struggled to get paid work. Every single artist I've interviewed reported that from 2010 to 2013, in the build-up to the event, they were regularly asked to work for no pay or low pay on the basis that they would you know, be doing it for the community or enhancing their CV if they were working with one of the prestige artists. And when they were contracted for payment, they experienced long delays. In fact, court cases were required in the case of people who hadn't been paid for over a year. Uh, artists with 20, 10, 20, 30 years of experience embedded in the communities for years found themselves struggling to survive. Most of those artists did get some paid work during 2013, but every artist interviewed was out of work, out of any paid arts work for at least three months of 2014. 
because the money had dried up. Since 2013, they've moved out of their homes, relying on parents or partners for accommodation and financial support. Some have turned to working outside of the arts. Some, lots of work, turned to working more outside of the community sector. Um, interestingly, only three are in receipt of any kind of welfare. Um, one's a single mum. Uh, one and getting child benefits. One's getting child benefits. One's getting tax credits. A lot of them do a bit of yoga to try and stay calm. But increasingly, they're working outside of Northern Ireland and particularly outside of Derry, Stroke, London, Derry because there's more work in Dublin and London and Scotland. And although they're tending to commute, uh, increasingly every single one of them, apart from the three who are on some form of welfare, have uh, been taking serious steps towards long-term migration. Um, they all report that many of their colleagues have left. Dozens migrated permanently to England, Australia, or Canada. Um, there might be many reasons for that. You might want to sort of pursue a better career, but the loss of this skilled workforce presents a collective problem for social regeneration policy, peace building, and community cultural development because the most successful aspect of peace building and community development in Northern Ireland has been cultural and arts based. Over the years, they built up their expertise and relationships within their communities. They were often called on to draft in the community volunteers for the projects of the big artists because they knew the people and they had the trust with the people and otherwise they weren't going to turn up. But they've had to survive for long periods with low levels of remuneration and their capacity to travel for work is a sign of their personal resilience, but their long-term departure would be a significant loss for the communities that they work with. Now, they're all committed to this art school practice. They love it. There are high levels of satisfaction with the activity. It's rewarding. It's rewarding for them. It's rewarding for their participants. It's fun. It's enjoyable. It's challenging. It makes life worth living. Um, they've worked with school groups, young people, older people, prison officers, migrant groups, and they report significant improvements in the quality of life for their participants, as do official evaluations. Some are a bit annoyed that they're constantly having to report on policy agenda. Um, arts is not a lever. People cannot be levered. Uh, and yet it's, you know, it's only funded if it's a social instrument um, for making changes. But they're committed to their communities. They know that it does make changes, and they are in it for the reward of the art for its own sake as well. Um, although the public funding might be problematic to some in terms of instrumentalism, the reliance on that funding has left them vulnerable when it's been reduced. The emphasis of funding regimes on short-term and outcome-oriented programs means there's limited opportunities to develop a sustainable program within one community over years. They're often doing three or four of these projects at one time. They're often having to deliver them in the same time frame because, you know, the financial year ends. Quick, can you give me 17 workshops because we have to spend the money that we didn't spend before Christmas, etc., etc. So they can end up having, after months of no work at all, 80 hours a week, seven days a week, six or seven projects being juggled at the same time. Uh, some of them with, you know, they might have a learning disability group in the morning, an older people group in the afternoon, and then a cross-community youth group in the evening. Um, they never know when the next job is coming from. They are an artistic precariat. So resilience, very popular word these days. There's three different varieties that I've been looking at, personal resilience, economic resilience, and Community resilience. Personal resilience is how you cope psychologically and mentally. Economic resilience is how you survive financially. And community resilience, the capacity to maintain cohesive and secure societies. Now, McPherson et al. have identified after a literature review of over 190 sources that personal resilience can be significantly improved by arts participation, communication skills, socialization, um, empathy, Etc. It addresses well-being too, the five principles of well-being. Meanwhile, artists are pretty good at the economic resilience. They're very good at finding other funding streams. For instance, the study of artists working with disabled children and young people in East Midlands, they have found numerous other funding streams, the arts and artists and arts organisations. However, the programs provided to the disabled young people have been reduced. So they're very good at getting money from working for other businesses or whatever 
but once they find those other funding streams, they're no longer providing the pro programs or the services for the disabled and the poor people that they were working with when they were funded to be community artists. So the trouble is the ability to cope with adversity is challenged by the ability to cope with the financial instability. While participants might develop further resilience from being in the program, the artist's resilience is being undermined by the fact that they don't know where the next job or pound is coming from. Now, globally, oh, sorry, go back. Globally, this is the second half, bottom half of the slide, Increasingly, with you know, neoliberal economic restructuring, there is a, it has been identified a process of precarisation. Yeah? There are fewer jobs for life. Job security is in decline. There's an increasing awareness of precarisation as a phenomenon. And people are becoming increasingly fascinated with creative industries and arts workers. How have they been managing all this time with that kind of precarious lifestyle? Maybe it's because of the flexibility, the opportunity to express themselves and so on and so forth. Uh, and while our jobs are becoming casualised, maybe we can look to the people who've been casualised forever for tips on how to, you know, to, to survive that or even you know, realise the best opportunities from it um, and liberating creativity or independence from hierarchical structures. However, as Frederick Lloyd Don points out, um, we need to heed the warnings when those artists are struggling to survive at all. Is that the direction of the entire workforce? And do we want their challenges as well as freedoms to become a norm. Okay, so how they've been managing. Uh, fundraising, they're doing a lot of fundraising, charity raffles and bake sales. The trouble is they're usually sort of raging the money from within the disadvantaged communities, which means the people who are, have the least are paying the most. They are turning towards corporate sponsorship and investment with some success. But any sustainable economy, depending on private investment, requires infrastructural development uh, to support that economic growth. Um, so, for instance, while the highest levels of economic growth were identified in the UK out of all the creative industries within the arts sector, the Arts Council of England has responded by creating new funding streams to support that highest level of economic growth. So, while the creative industries as a whole have been growing, the art sector, more than advertising, more than architecture, has contributed a significant amount more to GDP since the recession in 2010. And so instead of saying, well, they're doing great on their own, let's leave them to it, the Arts Council of England is going, right, well, let's support those artists even more. And one of the new funding streams is direct funding of individual artists rather than program and project funding for, through arts organisations. Now, sponsorship user pay schemes are suggested by the business model of the arts, but community arts practice comes from a different tradition, so a lot of them have been doing what they've always done, which is sharing and pooling resources. As you can see, Derry Creatives and Fun Palace are one uh, Derry Stroke London Derry based or collective of artists who provide studio space to each other at no cost or promote each other's events or, in some cases, uh, and I myself have done this, when you're paid by a project, you might subsidise the participants' cost of transport or childcare because they've got even less than you do. Um, so they're sort of pooling their meagre resources. Uh, the Dairy Creatives Groups is meeting monthly. And the International Fund Palace website, which says there's no austerity of creative people, was a significant event in, in the city recently. However, the group is led by staff from organisations that are subsidised, such as Voluntary Arts Island and Hashtag Brand NI. So the point there is you can do something with nothing, but especially if you do know somebody else who has something. So what are we going to do about it? Well, international policy options. Good old Australia. Wonderful to hear that they provided a, a minimum rate of pay for people on zero hours contract. One thing that they've done is to develop a community cultural development worker model. So in 2001, uh, a study showed that community arts workers were the lowest paid and the most precarious of all arts professions. By 2011, they had doubled their median personal income and were the least precarious, the least likely to work outside of the arts sector because they became community cultural development workers who were employed by local authorities which meant there was a reduced cost to communities and organisations they were sent out to because they had a salary from the council. This also significantly reduced the cost of community arts 
provision. It doubled the money in the pocket of the artist. It reduced the amount of money coming out of the taxpayer's pocket. Win-win, I would think. So we might want to consider that. Uh, however, it does create that schism between community cultural development worker and pure artist, which is, um, doesn't exist in Northern Ireland. One of the interesting things is that the people who are on your screens and in your galleries are also working with the community. So we wouldn't want to necessarily create that division, but it does provide more um, stability. In France, you have the Antimiton de Spectacle system, whereby a freelance performing artist is given a basic level of income, and on top of that, if they earn 20,000 euro a year from freelance work, the government pays them another 20,000 euro a year on top of that, if they can demonstrate that they've had at least 20 gigs per year as a freelance artist. An attempt to close that down by Sarkozy and then Holland led to nationwide strikes which paralyzed the country, and uh, they didn't. So freelance artists in, in France are still getting it because the large majority of the population, it seems, support the idea of subsidized freelance artists because if, if there is no art, there is no France. Um, and then there's the universal basic income model, increasingly in the news these days because they're trying it out in Scotland, Canada, Netherlands, Findia, F Finland, Findia, Finland, and now India. And again, what's interesting with the universal basic income model is it might sound a little bit social democratic, lefty, namby pamby, or giving money to people for free. But on the other hand, Indian government, who is not really known for its leftist leanings, is looking closely at it because it reduces overall welfare and development costs significantly. Basically, again, you skip the middleman, you put the money straight into the pocket of the poor people, you have fewer people having to be paid for administrative salaries or project to project funding, and so on and so forth everybody unconditionally gets a flat rate of income, no matter what they do, what their behavior, what they're standing, what other money they earn, that is enough, it's pegged to the cost of living, that is enough to pay the rent and feed the kids. Now, artists famous for working on the smell of an oily rag, give them a UBI, that's the oily rag. I'm not saying you'll get the rest of their work for free, but once the basic level of sustainability is provided, you will at least retain them. Okay. Now, I would suggest we could, alongside the, the, the pilot studies in Glasgow and Fife, which are with people on benefits generally, or I think it's similar in Finland and the Netherlands and Canada, that they're, they're, they're trying out UBI with people who are already on welfare, is if we tried it out with people who are already freelance artists, say if we expanded the existing um, range of, uh, of funding streams for individual artist grants to having identifying maybe... Uh, a maximum of 100 regularly employed freelance artists with qualifications who work, you know, an average of four to six uh, jobs per year with recognised organisations, etc. Try out a UBI with them and see if one, that increases the sustainability of the sector, two, decreases the cost of the sector, and three, retains some of these workers for their vital uh, work, particularly increasingly in the health sector where uh, often if you go to a nursing home, the only activity apart from medical is cultural. Uh, often when you go to uh, learning disabilities programs, again, apart from medically oriented activities, it's the cultural activities that develop the communication skills. And as I said, with um, the ongoing, uh, I don't want to say segregation, but with the fact that uh, less than 6% of our schools are integrated, uh, the fact that arts activities are frequently the only opportunity uh, people from different backgrounds have to work with each other before they're in the workforce or university, it's also vital to maintaining the possibility of conflict transformation. So I would say it's a good idea to keep paying these guys because otherwise we're going to lose all of them uh, to other countries or other sectors. I mean, one of them's just gone into uh, full-time work in restaurants and that's after 10 years of experience in a university degree in a skill area that's related to this uh, field, apart from the ones who've moved. Okay, um, you don't have to do that. I know it's gonna be difficult. <laughs> uh, but when, when, when we do have uh, an administration again, I think it would be worth considering because it both decreases the costs from the uh, exchequer when we have cuts and at the same time increases the resilience of the artists and the communities. I'll stop now. Thank you very much. Thank you.